Hello and uh, welcome to the day two of uh, the 2021 uh, virtual uh, Zero Research Symposium. I'm Igor Chirikov, Zero Consortium Director and Senior Researcher at the Center for Studies in Higher Education at UC Berkeley. And uh, yesterday we had um, we had three great sessions uh, full of engaging discussions on, on climate and belonging in, in undergraduate education. And today we uh, switch uh, to the graduate and professional education. And I look forward to a three very interesting sessions. Um, before, um, before we begin the plenary session, um, I would like to uh, say a few kind of uh, Zoom housekeeping notes. First of all, uh, all sessions uh, will be recorded, so we uh, will, and we'll make available these recordings to um, on the CCG website and uh, and also YouTube channel. And during the symposium, please keep your microphone muted uh, unless you would like to uh, ask a question. Uh, we recommend that you turn video on so we can all you know see each other, especially if you're asking a question. And again, very much welcome your questions. Uh, and comments uh, to ask a question, please use uh, a chat function or type and type question there or use kind of a raise hand uh, function and, um, um, and and if you'd like to kind of voice your question. Uh, in that case, it would be great if you can say your name and uh, where you're from. So uh, with that, let's uh, now transition to the to the plenary session. Uh, program climate in graduate education during uh, COVID-19. And uh, I would like to introduce uh, Scott, uh, the, our session chair, Scott Lanyon, uh, Vice Provost and Dean of Graduate Education at the University of Minnesota. And also is also the chair of uh, Zero Consortium Board and, and uh, Zero, Zero Supporter. Um, uh, Scott, uh, happy to turn it over to you. Thanks, Igor. Um, happy to join everyone this morning or this afternoon or wherever you happen to be. Um, you know, with institutions committed to increasing the diversity of students receiving graduate degrees, understanding program and campus climate has become really critically important because no matter how successful we are in recruiting students from underrepresented populations, uh, we're not gonna achieve our goal of increasing number of students from those populations obtaining advanced degrees if the climate is not welcoming. And furthermore, our goal in all of this and our diversity isn't simply to increase the diversity of students receiving degrees, it's also to have our graduate programs and disciplines improve, to change as a result of the increased diversity of views and experiences that are represented in our graduate student population. That's not gonna happen if what we're doing is actually forcing students to change who they are rather than the program changing in response to the students. So climate really is really central uh, to all of this. And in 2019, when we first proposed this plenary topic, um, it was apparent that uh, these are critically important, but it's even more important now um, as we see this, the stress imposed by the pandemic um, has made the existing weaknesses in our, our client, uh, program climate, campus climate more apparent, more apparent than ever. So that's the topic today, really looking at how Grad Seru can help us uh, with this. There are gonna be three phases of our session. Um, we'll do some quick introductions to start off with of our panel members. Um, I will then pose some framing questions to our panelists to get us started. Uh, and then uh, we'll use the remaining time to open it up for questions from the audience, uh, as well as opportunities for panelists to ask more questions of each other. So as Igor mentioned, uh, my name is Scott Lanyon. In addition to moderating the session, um, uh, I am Vice Provost and Dean of Grad Ed at the University of Minnesota. It's a public R1 institution with about 16,000 graduate and professional students. Uh, and I also chair the Cerro Consortium Board. Um, it, has Lisa joined us yet? Yes, so sorry. I got caught in the vortex of an unexpected Apple update. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Don't you just love those? Okay, well, so Lisa Garcia Bedoya, uh, Vice Provost for Graduate uh, Studies and Dean of Grad Division at UC Berkeley. Uh, you wanna introduce yourself further than that, Lisa? Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, like Scott said, I'm Lisa Garcia Bedoya from UC Berkeley. I use she, her, AF pronouns. Um, I'm responsible for the roughly 12,000 graduate students on the Berkeley campus um, and for our 125 graduate programs. 
Thank you. And joining us from the Council of Graduate Schools is the CGS president, Dr. Suzanne Ortega. Suzanne? Um, thanks, Scott. It's a real pleasure to be here with you today. Um, for those of you who do not know, uh, the Council of Graduate Schools is a higher education association with approximately 500 US Canadian um, members and 35 or so international members, all focused on the question, how do we create access and success in the highest quality graduate education possible? Um, I am a social scientist by training. Um, in fact, um, uh, my area is psychiatric epidemiology. So the concerns about health um, and wellness um, and how we support students um, in, on their journey is hugely important to me. Thanks, Scott. Thank you. So to start us off, um, uh, I'll just ask a couple of questions. As Igor mentioned, uh, we're going to have this uh, question discussion at the end. So please hold until um, the end, unless if you have a question um, that you really need clarification of something uh, that we're saying, or you want us to elaborate on something we're saying, please use the, the chat function to ask that. And Igor can try to cue us in that we've got questions uh, coming up. And we'll try to address as many of those during our presentation as possible. So uh, to start, you know, it, in my intro, I asserted that understanding program and campus climate was of critical importance. And I know the three of us agree on that, but I'm really curious to hear from each of you as to why. You know, from your own perspectives, there are very different roles at CGS or as a, 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 a Dean of Grad Ed. Um, why is building an inclusive climate uh, an, essential, an essential component of excellence in doctoral education? Suzanne, let me start with you from a CGS 60,000 foot perspective. Well, it will be CGS and it will be my uh, disciplinary background yep. um, to be sure. Um, I wanna start by saying for me, there is a utilitarian function of inclusion, but I really wanna start with the moral dimension. Um, I believe that we are morally committed as educators and as citizens to realize the promise um, embedded in the Declaration of Independence and other documents to create opportunities and pathways for success. Um, as institutions incredibly important um, to the conduct of society, we have been both shaped by a history of systemic um, racism and exclusion and also have a unique opportunity to remedy it. And I'm gonna, this is my high horse, but I'm simply gonna say that trust in higher education, um, trust in the work we do, I think fundamentally depends on our capacity to deliver on the promises and the commitments we make. And in part, those promises are recognized in the fruits of what we do. So I'm, for me, this is a, is a starting point. And then I would say, and besides, we already know that standard models of creating knowledge are not fast enough in their incremental um, approach in one method and model to meet the absolutely critical in our lifetime challenges of climate change, of pandemic and future pandemics. And we simply need to be in a position to create learning environments where we are free to engage in the what if, how about questions that only come when not only the question, but the methodologies used to serve, serve them are open for explanation. So I'm gonna say that high quality knowledge creation, particularly that directed towards the gnarly problems of the world fundamentally depend on an environment that fosters critical inquiry and respect. So, so what what does that what does that mean critic respect i mean i i guess i would be there were lots of adjectives i would use to describe what i mean by inclusion i think we know from data and elsewhere that fundamentally um inclusive environments are are, are contingent upon individuals feeling respected feeling heard um feeling a sense of belonging and feeling that their own unique perspectives and life experiences are not hidden under a rubric of color or gender or identity blindness, but are acknowledged and accepted into a community of belonging. 
and the third thing I would simply say is we know from Scott Page's work and others that the quality of innovative responses, technologies and others um, into the marketplace is always better served by diverse communities than those that are monolithic. So that would be my um, why it matters and is fundamental to quality. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, thanks, Suzanne, sorry. Lisa, your perspective. Well, I think Suzanne just said it beautifully. Um, I would only add, if we believe that our job in higher education is to produce knowledge, um, to serve the greater good, as Suzanne very much spoke about, then we cannot do that, as she alluded to, without leveraging the full range of human innovation and creativity. And so that means having people in the room that have different life experiences, different ways of looking at problems, but also expanding our definition of what knowledge is of value. So people's um, affective experiences, uh, you know, day to day. Um, and so really broadening, there's an intellectual piece to this and there's a, an inclusive piece to this. And if we look at the demographics of, of who's creating that knowledge right now on our campuses, it doesn't reflect the society in which we live. And unless we believe that human capacity is differentially distributed based upon um, different categories of difference, then we have to believe that there's something flawed in how we are choosing to shape the communities that we are building on our campuses. And so it's really important to understand that we are in fact doing ourselves a disservice by not being more expansive in our definitions of excellence and in our definitions of knowledge. And I just wanted to give a concrete example of what this means. Um, some of you may have seen the stories, this was about a couple of years ago, about a, a Norse Viking um, burial site. This was found in the mid 19th century and it was the foundation for the study of sort of Norse society and life moving forward. And the burial site included, so there was a person, um, but they were buried with two horses, with a number of weapons, um, a number of um, strategy games like chess and other things. And so there was much debate about who this person was and what they did. And it was eventually determined that it was a warrior. The question no one ever asked, it was assumed that it was a man. No one ever asked in 150 years the gender of the body because that just wasn't within the realm of comprehension of the people who were viewing the situation. And so I think it's a good example. It wasn't until a few years ago that some um, anthropologists sort of looked at the, at the pelvic bones and said, hey, wait a minute, this actually, this actually is a woman. And, and how different would our study of that society have been had we asked that question in the 1850s? And so there are many ways in which um, we are limiting the questions we're asking and therefore the answers we can uh, arrive to um, by virtue of the fact that we don't have a more expansive, um, I guess, slice of humanity in the room. And so that's, that's in order for us to serve our purpose, we have to, in fact, be inclusive in, in all the ways that, that Suzanne so eloquently talked about. Thanks, Lisa. And sort of, you know, with that as the starting point, so we need to do this, right? This is really, really important for all kinds of reasons. So the next step really is, uh, given that this is a research symposium, um, to talk about the role of data. Uh, so what is the role of data in creating an inclusive climate? So my own research career involved, so I'm an evolutionary biologist, by the way, uh, I'm hoping that change in grad ed will happen in somewhat faster than we typically find in evolutionary biology. Um, I collected a lot uh, and analyzed large amounts of data. Uh, and so it's probably not a surprise that sharing data, uh, collecting and sharing data is sort of a priority for me personally uh, and has been as I've been in this, uh, this role as a grad dean. And we place special emphasis on providing programs and colleges um, with the, you know, the data that they need about climate uh, to make change since many of the, much of the work that needs to be done in climate has to be happening at that local level. And I've learned a lot since we've started this. Um, the first is that typically climate assessments are happening or available at the campus level and campus level information obscures all kinds of things that are happening uh, uh, at the local level. So at Minnesota, you know, 88% of our uh, respondents in 2019 to grad zero agreed or strongly agreed 
that the environment or climate of their program was positive and welcoming. Great, you know, any provost or president receiving that summary would be happy to move on. Okay, that's not a problem I have to deal with, right? Uh, they have many other things uh, and many other fires to deal with. Um, but we have some programs uh, where less than half of the respondents were positive about the climate in their program. Having program level data, such as we get from Grad Seru, um, is really critical. Um, but even program level data, it's really fascinating, um, obscures the kinds of differences that we observe between identity groups. So it's not enough just to have program level data. Again, one of the things that I love about Grad Seru is to be able, as long as we have sufficient sample sizes, um, to look at uh, the different experiences of uh, students from different identity groups within the local program. And that's something we can do with Grad Seru. So if we filter by identity group, we can characterize each program as falling into one of three bins is something we've been doing recently. Those programs in which the majority of students uh, believe the climate is positive, that's great. Um, those in which the majority of uh, students, regardless of identity group, think that that's true. Programs in which um, actually both all identity groups think that the climate is bad. Okay, that tells us something and we can do something there. But it probably of the most interesting are the programs where majority students think that the climate for underrepresented students is great. But if you ask, if you look at the responses from underrepresented students from underrepresented populations, their perception is quite different. That disparity in perception of what's going on in climate is really important to be able to ferret out and something that we're now able to do in a way that just wasn't possible before we had this information. So GradSero enables us to inform graduate programs uh, that not only when the students are unhappy, but where there are disparities. So that's one way we're thinking about using data to help programs think about climate. I'm curious to hear from both of you, you know, how the role you see uh, us using data to affect change so that our campuses, our programs are more welcoming and inclusive. So Lisa, let me start with you on this one. Yeah, and just to, um, that was really helpful, Scott. So for folks know, so my training is as a political scientist and I'm a mixed method researcher. So I use all kinds of data uh, to try to answer questions about community organizing. That's what I study. Um, as grad dean, I've been thinking a lot about this. Um, I think the first thing we don't talk enough about is what does success look like? So Scott, you mentioned, right? 88% people happy. Well, is that good? Like, what is good? What, what, what's the number that we're really trying to look for? What's reasonable? And how do we really think about that? Because I think what's more important, in fact, is to think about the 12%, right? Or even the 5%, mm -hmm. um, because they, they're telling us something, right? They're the canaries in the coal mine in terms of telling us something about our programs. So the way that I'm thinking about it is that I think it's going to be really important for us institutionally, at least at Berkeley, to triangulate different kinds of data to try to get a more holistic vision of the health of our graduate programs. And so the, the kinds of zero data, big climate data at the program level, exactly as you talk about, is very important. Um, but you know, even if it's only one person in an apartment that feels like the department is toxic or, or, or unwelcoming, that is important data to have. Um, what I found on our campus, and I'm sure it's true on many people's campuses, is that we have a lot of data that we just don't analyze. And so what we've been working on is how do we, this is somewhere where I think the center can be of great value, is how do we analyze the data um, and then give it back to departments in ways that are in fact legible and usable? Because I think that's been another challenge for us. And so we have, for example, we've taken an exit survey of every doctoral student that's ever graduated you know, for decades. We don't give that data back to the departments. We don't look systematically at change over time. And so I think really thinking about what are the metrics that we wanna use? What do we think success looks like? And then how do we get the information we need in order to really understand the health of the program? And so we're thinking at multiple levels. There's the general climate data, which we think is really important. We're thinking about innovating in looking at how senses of climate and well-being change over the course of the year. We did pulse surveys last year on campus, um, quarterly surveys, thinking about doing that more often just to get a sense of how the rhythm of the academic calendar affects um, well-being and, and feelings of belonging. And then also, 
you know, are there particular points looking very closely at when people leave programs? Who are the people who are leaving programs? Are there particular points in the program when, so that my goal is to be able to sit down annually with every program and be able to talk through all different kinds of pieces to, to, of data to work together to think about what are the things that they need, what's going well, and where are the places perhaps where they need a little bit of help in ensuring that all their students are able to be successful um, throughout their time on campus. And so I think being systematic in that way, but being really thoughtful about what our goals are, and then also appreciating that it's an iterative process and it's a conversation um, is the way that I think we're approaching data. And that I think is the way to make data um, help inform right, broader attempts to really improve the quality of our programs. I really love your comment about the one student. Uh, one of the things that I've run into is um, talking to a program saying, you know, you have 24% of your respondents are really unhappy with the climate. Uh, and the response from the program director is, well, there were only 50 students who responded and that's not a representative sample. We have 200 students in the program. And my response is, that's 12 people. It may not be representative of the whole program, but 12 of your students are really unhappy. I think that's probably pretty important. And it's some of the time I think we need to go there is to really make sure that people are talking about individuals, not just data points, but the, the individuals that those points represent. So uh, I really appreciate that, uh, that comment. Suzanne, your thoughts about this? I guess I would say um, my major comment is that data are absolutely necessary, but not sufficient, um, by which I mean our faculty colleagues value data. Um, they are actually um, driven by facts or their perception of facts. I will also say that many are made uncomfortable by data. So almost surely you have been in conversations that went, well, there's a problem with these methods. There's a problem with response bias. There's a problem, this can't be us. So for me, the, the trick is how do we figure out ways to share data as administrators or with our colleagues in departments that invite people into, I loved your word, um, Lisa, into a conversation that invites their curiosity and they're in, into a conversation to explore something they hadn't actually realized was characteristic of their department. And if we can find a way that piques their curiosity and reduces the defensiveness with which they come to this conversation, we really have a situation that's ripe for culture change and dialogue at the department level, which of course is where students most experience both positive cl climate um, and, and negative ones. Um, so I think there are a lot of interesting questions about that. And uh, there are reasons why one might want to include climate data in an overall program review. Um, it can't, get, but, but you have to, holding people accountable for change is important, but understanding what, are, what is the cost benefit of holding people accountable and getting candid, honest, um, reflection about how we could get better um, may not incur in tandem. I think the right unit of analysis is hard for some of the reasons, Scott, you mentioned. If you want to point out real differences in the experience of marginalized individuals from marginalized identities or groups, you're very likely to have a challenge of sample size um, that you it will be hard to share um, without compromising somebody's um, confidentiality. And then the question is, are there ways of using these data, maybe across colleges or in a comparison of broad sweeps of fields to get people's attention and to get them asking, is this us? And if we're better, I guess you get to pat yourself on the back. And if you're far below um, those uh, with whom you have a healthy competition, it often is a drive to get the conversation going. Thank you. And, and your comment about, you know, so figuring out how to, uh, invite faculty into a conversation about the data is, is a great advertisement for my talk a little bit later this afternoon, where I talk about all the ways we're trying to do that at Minnesota. So thank you, Suzanne, for that. Um, so improving climate, um, and, and this is really a good segue into this question. It's, it, 
if we're going to improve climate, it really takes action at multiple levels within an institution, right? Um, so the, the grad school, the academic college, or multiple colleges in the case of interdisciplinary or intercollegiate programs, the graduate program itself, the students uh, often play a role. So, you know, we've concluded that our role as a graduate school um, is to really make the data available, but not necessarily to analyze it ourselves, uh, to offer suggestions, tools, consultations to help programs and colleges to take action. Um, but it's really, the, in many cases, the role of the college and the program to figure out what steps to take locally based on the data that they have. Um, so I am gonna talk about that later this afternoon. Um, but, but that's the way things are structured at, at Minnesota. We are a very decentralized institution. Different institutions are probably gonna to have to take different approaches to this. And I'm really curious to see, um, Lisa, what, how does this work? How do you see this playing out on your campus? No, that's an excellent question. Um, Berkeley is what we call radically decentralized. Um, <laughs> Graduate education sits in the departments. It, the heart of it is in the departments. And so I've been thinking a lot about how the graduate division can be a value added for those departments so that we're doing the things that they shouldn't have to do. And so if you think about things that everyone has to do, right? Everyone has to do admissions, right? Everyone has to think about climate. And especially after the um, social unrest last year, there was a lot of desire on our campus uh, to, to think deeply about how to change things in, in a meaningful way but folks just didn't know how, right? People aren't expert in this, this isn't their area of research. And so we've really tried to be that value added. And so a few things that we've done, um, we uh, funded, uh, invested one and a half million dollars in what we're calling a graduate diversity pilot program. And so we funded, it's not a lot of money, but for four years, we funded nine departments. And we're very intentional that all, to, to have them in every part of campus. So they reflect every different type of, of graduate training that we do. And they're working together as a, as a learning community. So they're learning from one another in terms of how things go. And then the idea is to develop, to develop a sense, set of best practices for campus in order to help other departments um, come up with ideas. And, and especially setting the expectation, I think often because we're so into the 100% in the academy, we don't talk enough about how we should expect failure. If, if in fact we are experimenting in the ways that we need to experiment, we have to have some things that don't work. And in fact, we may learn more from those than the ones that do. So that's one piece. And what came out of the conversations with those departments this year was the need for support, um, especially in admissions, um, but also just you know, information about research. There's lots of research in this area, right? Um, making it easy to get. And so the two things that we're doing is we're having um, a, a, a whole institute on admissions where we're going to bring, uh, Julie Pasalt um, has been a tremendous partner for us She's at USC, she's an expert in graduate diversity. If folks don't know of her, she's done two workshops and we're going to continue to bring her and, and other experts in to help people build holistic admissions from the ground up instead of just adding it to what was already there. We're also starting um, a graduate diversity academy built along four pillars. And so it's admissions, belonging, climate and data since we talked about data. And the idea is that staff and faculty who are interested, again, totally voluntary, once a month, we're going to bring in a national expert to just talk about uh, the latest and greatest in those areas. But most importantly, making sure that at the end of those conversations, there are concrete recommendations on how to implement those things. And so we think our job in the center is really to, to be a warehouse for that information, to help curate those conversations so that then departments can decide how they carry that out within the context of their particular programs and their particular climates. Thanks, Lisa. Suzanne, how do you see this concept of at one extreme, Berkeley radical decentralization <laughs> to, I'm not sure who would be at the other, at the other extreme of, of really strong centralization. How do you see that affecting our attempts to use data to affect climate uh, change in grad ed? Yeah, I'm not sure I know a single graduate dean who would say their university was radically centralized. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> but but I have to I have to think about that. Scott, I don't know if I can respond directly to that, but maybe I'll wander into yep. an answer. Um, because the fact of the matter is I currently don't sit on a campus. Um, mm -hmm. Were I on a campus, I would be working directly with 
program directors and faculty within those directors to understand the needs of students and doing the kinds of strategies that Scott, you're doing at Minnesota and Lisa, you're doing at Berkeley. Our TAC recognizes that the action happens primarily at the department level. And so we've tried to provide um, things like uh, a, diverse, a statement of commitment to diversity that's a broad enough framework that it can um, leave room both for institutional differences, but disciplinary differences within it, and to use it as a simply as a heuristic to help people think about approaches um, to program change. Likewise, our mental health framework is an attempt to create a set of actionable items at different levels of the organization, but recognizing that the department is really where students live and experience the tensions of either belonging or feeling excluded. But I wanna tell you what I've really been thinking about a lot recently, and maybe I'm taking us in a larger direction and it moves, but it moves us from work that starts at the ground to work that begins at the highest level of the university and is really going to require university presidents and others to really think about this. I, I want to make the case that a lot of exclusion and a lot of stress derives from a kind of hyper competitiveness within the academy that is focused and always measured in terms of very traditional very narrow criteria indicating impact and quality of research. And until we're willing collectively to ask the question, are, is it possible to imagine a framework that validates emerging modes of scholarship disseminated perhaps to non-academic audiences as well as academic audiences to imagine the kind of work that is a bold imaginative failure as contributing and driving the body of knowledge. We have really created an environment that through the entire faculty tenure and promotion and recognition system reproduces in departments, hyper-competitive, very narrowly conceived measures of what constitutes high quality research and faculty and student excellence. And so I would really argue that while culture change has a lot of room and we can make a lot of progress at the department level, if we don't have the courage to tackle these big macro pictures of, of what, what are the truth claims we make and how do we think about and imagine impact and success, we're not gonna make much progress at the ground level because it flies in contradiction of the things that people are rewarded for. Um, across their university within disciplinary societies and the academy writ large. Scott, Scott, you muted. My dog was barking. I thought you didn't want to hear it, so I decided to mute myself. Um, we're at the point now where uh, we are open to questions. Please use the raise hand function, chat, uh, whichever. And panelists, feel free to ask questions of each other as well. Um, John Douglas uh, posted this in chat. Grad Sarah and other sources show significant anxiety among graduate students regarding preparation and networking for non-academic jobs. And I would say that that's a component of climate, right? We, we know that there are students who feel very unwelcome because their career path is not what they think their advisor or the faculty might think is appropriate. So the question is, what can uh, or are deans and campus leadership doing to address this issue? Lisa, you wanna start on that? Yeah, I think that's an excellent question, John. And at least in my experience, um, often students probably often by the end of their second year, it's pretty clear to them that the academic world is not for them, um, but we don't have a lot of uh, nice sort of stepping off points or other options, right, that, that, that students give. And, and I, I think it's unrealistic to expect faculty to advise students in this. We're very good at replicating ourselves. We're not good at helping people think about other things. And that that, at least on our campus, we're thinking this is the graduate division's responsibility. So what I'm 
trying to do is build a structure where very early in people's careers, they're being given a broader set of options, right? Even if you, you know, people tend to think, oh, if you have a PhD in English, what can you do with a PhD in English? There's actually a lot of things you can do with a PhD in English and a lot of value to doctoral education in terms of the analytical skills that you gain, even if you don't end up uh, proceeding in, in a traditional uh, career path, academic career path. And so what we're trying to do is introduce students to those ideas early, trying to destigmatize that so that folks feel like they can really make a decision based on their needs and their desires and their passions rather than their advisor's expectations um, about what success looks like. And so bringing alumni, what we've been doing, Princeton, I think has done a really good job of this as well, bringing alumni back who've, who've had alternative paths, but just really having folks tell their stories, I think is, is of great value and helps students just sort of grow the box of possibility in their minds. And I think that helps mental health because if you feel like you're in this tiny little box that you don't fit into, that's often when students experience great kind of depression, stress, anxiety, and, and often then don't progress in their programs. And so I think the more we can open up the university of possibility for people, um, hopefully that will also improve student well-being. Thanks, Lisa. At Minnesota, we've got a variety of things that we're, we're working towards. Um, one is we have encouraged faculty um, to um, author and share with students an advising statement that really sort of unilaterally declares who they are, what they expect of students and what students can expect of them. And one element of that should be what they expect their students to do in terms of career paths so that students know even before they've selected an advisor, whether an advisor is open to alternative career paths um, or not. Um, we're really encouraging students to do uh, an individual development plan. Um, there again, that uh, ends up, and not necessarily share that with their advisor if there are portions of that that they don't feel they can, can share with their advisor because they may be on different, um, have different expectations. But the IDP helps students understand um, well, forces them to do some self-reflection about who they are, what their strengths and weaknesses are, and where they're going. And that can be very helpful in them as they think about uh, what additional mentors um, they might need. We've certainly been encouraging also graduate students to have mentors in addition to their advisor. And in many cases, those mentors should be selected based on the different kinds of career paths students might be interested in. As Lisa mentioned, um, alumni are really important here. Um, you know, we've been making an effort to find where our alumni are and what they're doing in part to educate faculty about what the career paths actually are of their, their alumni, their students, and to try to move culture that way. But also to educate faculty about what transferable skills are needed in different careers based on what the alumni say. And then to encourage students to actually um, participate in professional development, but professional development of their choosing based on what careers they're interested in. One of the things we're doing there is to try to um, assign digital badges to many of the uh, professional development opportunities on campus um, as a way of students documenting that they, for themselves and for their program, that they have been participating in these. I, I say that's what we're doing. All of that is in a very early stage with differential adoption by programs and faculty. Um, but collectively, I think those are the kinds of things that uh, can help in this space. Suzanne, anything to add from a CGS perspective or your own personal perspective? Oh, I would just add that this notion of career uncertainty is and, and uh, graduate student stress is absolutely clear. It's become even more clear from data arising out of Craig Ogilvie's study, some work we're doing that's post-pandemic. Again, the pandemic didn't create new things. It simply exacerbated and escalated trends. Um, just as parenthetically, I, I would say that in 2003 or four, when the first CGS Pathways project was, um, uh, or degree completion project was launched, I was at the University of Missouri doing a comp completion project and the overwhelming takeaway for us at that point was we called them discouraged dissertators. 
And what that meant was they saw no job on the other side and they couldn't figure out why they wanted to put themselves through the stress of finishing the darn thing when it was unclear what came next. So this, this notion of helping our students really not just promise, oh, you can do anything, but really creating that, a, a toolkit that helps them understand how they position themselves for those careers, I think is absolutely incredibly important. And the only hopeful note I will say is that I hear from colleagues around the country that this post-pandemic or this pandemic year has never seen a higher level of professional development participation. I mean, they've never had it. The virtual environment really seems to have been either because it's accessible or because people are more frantic. I can't decide which are really participating um, much more broadly um, in career exploration. Great. Igor, you have your hand raised. Yeah, I actually have a follow-up question on, on that. Uh, so Lisa and Scott, you mentioned that one of the ways that uh, graduate schools support you know, the exploration of non-academic careers just, you know, provide more options to students to think about and networking opportunities. I'm wondering how it affects the relationships with the advisors uh, and what what are the ways to uh, to help advisors realize that academic career is not the only path possible in academia because sometimes students feel that they are not comfortable to disclose to the advisors that they are thinking about non-academic careers because that way the advisors support them less and uh, they will not write them recommendation letters. They you know, will ignore them and they will prioritize basically those who will, you know, who have a promise you know, of academic career. So I'm wondering, like working with students is one side, is any, any uh, measures that can be done on, uh, or any ways to uh, engage uh, advisors with that? If I can jump in, I've, one of the things I've been doing um, as grad dean is, is what I've been calling my listening tour. So I've visited over 50 of our 80 departments now. And what has been striking to me is the degree to which that attitude is changing. Um, I think our, our especially you know, in places like the humanities where traditionally you would have expected that, people understand that the job market and the academic job market is such that, and so many of our departments had already started this work. So I think that has changed a bit. I think it's important to remember that in, in the engineering, physical sciences, it, it has always been the expectation that a good percentage of students end up going into industry and, and, and actually end up making a lot more money often than those that go in the academy. And so um, I think, you know, it may be different in other places, but at least at Berkeley, I feel like there's that shift. I think the the bigger issue is that then faculty don't feel capable of advising um, students. And so the structure we've put into place at Berkeley as part of our professional development program, in addition to the workshops, we do one-on-one -on -one consultations. We have what are called professional development li liaisons that students can meet with that can help them navigate that relationship. Because I do appreciate that, you know, it's complicated and can be scary for a student to, to tell a faculty member. They may not realize the faculty member is more open than perhaps they imagine. And so um, I think having that combination of not only kind of public events and other kinds of support, but um, opportunities to sort of figure out how to have that conversation and how to negotiate that relationship and figure out what you need from that advisor um, if you're going to go on an alternative path, I think is important um, as, a, as a support. Yeah, and as Lisa says, you know, this is changing, but that actually represents a problem for students because unless the faculty members are open about their own thoughts about appropriate career paths, the students are left guessing. They know that some of their faculty only want to train people to be faculty and others are open to it, but they don't know whether they can even ask the question. And so this is why sort of I, we think faculty really need to be having a conversation early with students about what they think so that the students know what's safe to talk about. Um, and so that is something that is changing. The good news is faculty attitudes are changing, but because we're in transition, students are still left going, I don't know what to do. Um, the other piece here that I think is important is that I think historically, traditionally, faculty have felt that their role was to be everything to the student. And, and faculty know that they're not qualified to mentor a student towards non-academic careers having never had one. So they feel guilty, they feel inadequate, and that actually makes them 
nervous to have those and probably in some cases to even subconsciously direct students more towards academia because they know that they themselves are not qualified to, to comment on alternative careers. So part of this, in answer to your question, Igor, we have to give faculty permission to say, I can't help you with that, except I will help you find mentors who can help you. And that's really important. I can't tell you the number of faculty who feel inadequate when faced with a student who wants to do something other than a faculty career. Suzanne? I was just gonna, going to add all these things are at, bringing back alums is a great strategy because actually it turns out that faculty get all excited about these successful people they didn't know were out there. Um, but the other thing I, I have found really interesting is a, some data we have from the PhD Career Pathways data that explored job transitions at three, eight, and 15 years out. Let me tell you that people move a lot, that the majority of people at each one of those transitions are in movement, um, are changing jobs within the last three years. But a non-trivial minority of those 15 years out are returning from industry, business, or governmental positions to the academy, and of those usually as faculty members. So this idea that you come to the fork in the road and you go academic or non-academic, and then your life is set, I think is um, increasingly not the case. And I think it might be heartening to some of our faculty colleagues who have dearly loved the richness of, of the academy who really can't imagine being happier to say, doesn't have to start now, it can be a part of a person's full career. Great. Dr. Narad, Narad I see your hand raised. Yes, um, I want to continue what Suzanne said. Indeed, showing faculty data by their department and their peers in the neighboring department, say in a sociology than the social sciences. And uh, what the reality is in terms of jobs. And for example, we found, and that was in 2008, that in the social sciences, it takes about four years till people have a more stable employment. So that's something important to know. There are postdocs that hang on, they do, so that they're not just totally desperate and anxiety because something doesn't come up. And it's very important what Suzanne said, that's not only in science and engineering that people come back to the university later after 16 years, but also in the professional fields, social work, public health, uh, education, so, and I think this is very important and what I think Lisa said or others already, providing um, workshops where you bring in your alumni, your alumni who are not in academia, but alumni in various business, government, nonprofits. Many young people are very keen working also in nonprofits in really supporting and bringing value to their education. And I think this is then faculty don't have the burden on their shoulders. Thank you. And, and we, we talked quite a bit about alumni and, and getting in, alumni involved or get information from them. Uh, I, I should point out too, that it's important to realize that Grad Cero is providing us with perspectives from our current students, right? What are their career aspirations? What are What's their level of satisfaction with the professional development that's being offered, both you know more broadly at the university, but uh, at the program level, and it's those are the kinds of things that will help us uh, change culture more quickly. Is to share with faculty what's actually happening, as opposed to what what they think is happening, which is frequently not very accurate. So um, I just uh, point out just how valuable Grad Cero is, is proving uh, in here and getting people to pay attention. Other comments or questions? I currently don't see any, any other questions in chat, but one thing that I would like, you know, this panel to address is maybe to uh, talk more about the impact. Oh, here, here's one, here's one uh, from Beatrice. But, 
uh, I will I'll finish and then may, maybe you know we can ask uh, Beatrice to uh, to ask her okay. question. Uh, so, but basically, I was wondering, like maybe you'll say a few words about the impact of COVID nineteen on uh, on climate and what were like the biggest takeaways in terms of what's not possible in that kind of a modality to do in online modality and or maybe on the positive side as well. What are the you know the the things that you realized uh, during the pandemic that you know were working or, or surprised you in a positive way as well. Great, but you're an organizer, so I'm going to come back sure. to your question, Beatrice. Yeah. Your your question. Hi, thank you. Um, I was sort of curious. I feel like, um, and I may have missed a little bit of it. My computer was doing some strange things, so I want to apologize in advance if this was already covered, but. I feel like there's often a discussion of academic versus non-academic jobs. And I feel like as a grad student, I never heard about academic jobs that weren't ladder faculty positions. And it feels like there's a really great opportunity given that we're all on the same campus to expose grad students to like non-ladder faculty academic positions. And I'm curious if you guys have any thoughts on like whether or not that's an avenue to explore more or ways to do that. Because I mean, as a non-ladder faculty academic position, I love my role and I think I could see other grad students loving roles like mine as well. And seeing that there being like more opportunities to explore these kinds of positions and make more connections. Well, I think that's one of the reasons why it's so important for us to be uh, doing something that grad school should have done you know 30 years ago which is to actually find out what our alumni do so that we can share that those opportunities with current graduate students and not have that rather crude distinction of oh these people work in higher ed and these people work in government and these people work someplace else <laughs> let's a little bit finer scale including whether they are uh, faculty positions or not um, and and identifying who they are and identifying or have asking them, what advice do they have for students who wish to follow that same career path? So I think that's all really important. Um, the other thing that your question brings to mind is this, this false dichotomy between uh, academia or even faculty and non-faculty positions in professional development. Frequently the way that's interpreted is, oh, well, we're doing things to prepare people to be faculty. We have to do special things to prepare all these folks for non-academic jobs. Well, I'm sorry, most faculty need that same professional development as well. And we can't lose sight of the fact that it would be helpful for people going towards faculty careers to know what leadership is about, to know how to manage projects, know how to communicate, all these kinds of transferable skills that for some reason have also often been forgotten when we make this false division. Oh, if you're going into the industry, we'll try to to figure out how to help you with this, but if you're faculty, nah, you don't need any of that. Suzanne? Well, two, two points. One is I know that there are a number of universities who are, exp are, are experimenting um, for precise, precisely the reason Beatrice said with uh, graduate assistantships located in different um, parts of the university, often in student affairs, sometimes in institutional research. Um, as long as these are closely constructed and it's not just work study clerical work, but is a real deep opportunity to contribute to the life of the university. This seems to me one easy um, way for students to get experience and try out the different places um, in the university they can um, participate. Um, I was gonna say something else triggered by your comment, Scott, but beats the heck out of me what it was. So we'll pass. <laughs> Lisa. I just wanted to add, um, Beatriz, thank you so much for your question. Um, bringing us back to the diversity point, I think it, it really speaks to the need. There, there was an expectation um, that all information would come through the faculty advisor and that somehow students would come in and, and just know, you know, what even what it means to be a faculty member. And so if we're bringing in people like me who had no experience in the academy before going to graduate school, we need to be much more explicit about exactly to Scott's point, what is, what is it, even what does a faculty career look like? We don't tend to talk about all the different kinds of faculty positions and then other kinds of jobs as well. So I think making that hidden curriculum no longer hidden is actually key in fact to, to the climate work that we've been talking about. And so the more that we can just 
make explicit um, what those opportunities are and, and what we don't talk enough about, you know, I try to tell my students, like, what do you want your day-to-day -day life to look like, right? Like, what do you want? You're, you're spending all this time studying. You should, in fact, then have, you know, something that gives you joy and that it makes you happy to wake up every day and go to work. And so to know more about the nuts and bolts of what those jobs even entail and what the possibilities are, I think is, is part of our responsibility if we want to make sure everyone has equal access to them. I also don't want to lose, though, Tong Chang's um, comment in the chat. Um, obviously, no one can thrive in graduate school if they if they don't have enough to eat and if they don't if they're not housed. And so um, we're working on that on our campus. We're you know we're not where we should be, but just want to acknowledge that there's been tremendous movement on basic needs, and I, I'm glad that we're shining a light on that in a way that we hadn't in the past. But it is a huge problem, at least for us at Berkeley, just because of the cost of living in the Bay Area. And that's a segue into uh, Igor's question about COVID-19, because of course, housing insecurity, food insecurity have all increased uh, during the pandemic. And just generally speaking, uh, Igor, um, grad ed, a graduate career is stressful under every circ all circumstances, right? Um, during the pandemic, um, stress levels for graduate students have really been high. Mental health concerns are really um, a major factor on all of our campuses. Um, and add to that, that um, graduation uh, is delayed for many of these students, um, which um, results in financial uh, challenges. Um, but all of this hits underrepresented communities harder in general. Um, and so I think that's where the intersection with climate is that there are, you know, we've been thinking primarily about um, what are the forces on campus that uh, affect ca campus climate that we, we should be thinking about. We still have those, but we also have all of these external forces that are relatively new here that are, that are exacerbating all of this. So um, I think that's, that would be my answer to how, uh, how the pandemic has really impacted graduate education. Oh, right. And then everybody is, is fearful that there will be no jobs, especially those who think that the only jobs that their program is preparing them for are faculty jobs, and they're hearing that nobody's hiring. So everybody needs to understand that um, stress levels are really high Anything we can do to eliminate unnecessary sources of stress in graduate education should be high on our list for actions. Other, there was a hand up briefly. Dr. Narad, I think, yes. Yes, but I think Suzanne also said she remembered what she wanted to say. Um, and then, so don't forget. Okay. I want to uh, say, uh, both what we talked about um, positions for doctorates in university itself and relating it to what Suzanne said earlier, really to create um, a more conducive climate. We really need to look also at quality of excellence, what we mean. And I want to bring in these two factors. What has been, I think, an all campus an issue our HR, there is academic HR and there is staff HR. And I remember from Berkeley, there were some graduate assistants who are actually at the University of Washington who have a doctorate, who love their job, but they are locked in in staff HR. There is hardly a career path and the, the prestige or the status is made aware uh, quite distinctly in certain situations. So I think another big perspective, Suzanne, would be really to look at the HR scales and how they're diverse and how they're split it up while we on the other side want to bring them together. Suzanne, did you want to follow up? Um, I really just put it in put okay. it in the chat, which is that we do have data since we're back to data and research that suggests that the intellectual skills used by alumni working within the academy and outside of the academy are 
far more similar than they are different. Uh, yeah. the, there are just a minority. So for those of our colleagues who think, oh God, I would hate to work in industry because everybody's going to tell me what to do and I only get to execute one small piece of the program and no room to conceptualize and, and see through to fruition a project. For those who responded, this just does not seem to be true. And and Linda posted, uh, Linda Mason posted uh, in the chat, um, you know, there's a tendency frequently for us to, to talk for whatever reason about PhD students and think about them being on assistantships, but research masters and professional students are paying their own way by and large, uh, most of our institutions and um, COVID-19 represents a si significant increase in uh, cost to their graduate education because of extending it. Um, and so that's important to keep in mind, uh, yet another source of stress for those students. Other questions or comments? Well, if I can just add briefly to that, again, as, as you bring different kinds of students to campus, our financial aid models are based on the presumption that everyone is sort of independent and only responsible for themselves. And that's just not the case. And so right. especially under COVID, our students have a lot of responsibilities to other family members. If they're student parents, they have other expenses. And so again, rethinking just who we imagine our students are and what different kinds of supports they might need and depending upon where they are in their life course is going to be important. And COVID just made it more clear to Suzanne's point. N nothing has changed, it all just got worse. Right. Yeah, actually, you know, uh, what I take away from a lot of this is we make a lot of assumptions in education generally, but certainly in graduate education, most of which we don't even know we're making. And it's a, it would be a safe route to take to really examine the assumptions that we make um, and really assess whether, um, whether they are part of the structural problem that we have um, that leads to structural racism, to lead to differential outcomes and so on. Um, that's just an important thing to keep in mind. Anything, I will point out to people, if you haven't been paying attention to chat, a number of people have posted URLs, which I believe in Zoom world disappear if you once you've left this um, session. So you might wanna copy those URLs before, uh, or actually Igor, we can probably send those out, can't we? Yeah, we, we will save chat and the session will stay until in, in, in right. three more hours. So we will, it will not be deleted immediately after this. Okay, one, good. So, yeah. Anyone else? We're a little bit over time, but we, we're happy to answer any more questions or continue this conversation. But if there isn't anything else. Oh, I have a question. Yes. I am concerned about the small parts of each department's population of color or otherwise first generation or underrepresented who don't always get the message that there have been graduates from that department who look like them, who've had very successful careers. And one of the things I think is very important in terms of shaping these alumni information sessions is to bring back particularly alumni from these underrepresented populations. Because um, in my research, it's very clear that there's ongoing dissatisfaction about not having faculty that looks like them or uh, faculty who rather understand their issues since um, particularly people from first generation backgrounds have this whole other issue with the hidden curriculum and so on. So I think that that's a, a way of sort of hitting several nails with one hammer, <laughs> so mm -hmm. to speak, because the diversity issue is an integral part of looking at the future. So that Thank you. Thank you. Other questions, comments? Oh, can you uh, can you move oh, mic on? My uh, microphone always oh, have a problem with my uh, external <laughs> microphone. So I have a kind of a follow up question. So probably in most institutions, uh, 
for almost all graduate programs, if not all many programs, uh, actually have a, a, a lot of international students. Uh, so these students uh, experience more challenges in terms of uh, uh, basically it's a uh, campus climate uh, and um, financial support is central. Uh, so how uh, like institutions would handle or, or, or help international students uh, um, succeed in their programs? Uh, so this could be particular after um, institutions reopen. So they need to come back from uh, different countries. Uh, uh, they may have more, uh, you know, uh, challenges uh, that time. Lisa, Suzanne. I guess all I can say is I totally agree. And again, if, if, if our job is to produce knowledge, we have to be global. Um, higher education needs to be global. And I, I think it's something that um, at least the federal government right now is pushing against in ways that, that are, I think, problematic for all of us. Um, I think all we can do is try to be sensitive to those concerns and flexible and, and find out, um, you know, speaking of data, right, be, be getting data from those students to see what are the particular needs that they have that might be different from our domestic students and trying to figure out how to how to find resources to support um, their particular needs. But it, I think it's going to be a huge challenge for, for a variety of reasons and depending on the countries people are coming from. And so we're just trying to be ready to be flexible. I think that's the most important thing to the extent we can be. And I would just add to Lisa's um, comment that we're seeing tremendous levels of stress among international students. In some ways, I think it came as a surprise early in the pandemic from those who were stranded in the US and couldn't go home um, to those who were stranded abroad and couldn't get back and the isolation of not being able to interact. Um, I mean, it's, it, it's almost palpable in the survey and the focus group responses. I do not think we have a comprehensive strategy yet. I do know, however, that international offices in conjunctions with graduate deans have been really thinking hard about how they're going to recreate community and support students um, as they're onboarded or reboarded or whatever the right term is. Um, and you raise a hugely important, very timely issue. There's a comment from uh, Ola Papula. Ola, do you want to? expand on your comment? Um, I was just interested in accountability frameworks that might be in place because, you know, the data has been saying the same thing for quite a while. Um, and, I, and I'm sure that uh, there are some programs um, on, 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 on campus um, to help promote um, this feeling of belonging and to improve climate. But I think the bigger question is, are there any accountability frameworks in place, such as if the data says the same thing next year and the year after that and the year after that, what are the consequences of that? Uh, because as long as you don't have a ways to measure whether whatever it is that you're doing is actually successful and B, um, consequences for being unsuccessful. Um, it's just like a rabbit chasing its tail. You just keep going round and round year after year after year. So unless uh, there is a way to have frameworks in place that says, okay, this is the target. This is what we expect to see when we do the same survey next year and the responses we expect to get. If we get something different, this is what would happen. And, and there might be, I'm just asking if, if those kind of things are in place. So I'll, I'll comment for Minnesota that while you're right that we've had the data, we've had the data at the campus level generally, at least at Minnesota. It's only with grad Saru just in the last few years that we've had uh, information at the, the program and college level, um, which is where the action needs to be. So now we have that. And, and uh, we have conversations, the, the grad school has conversations with colleges every year 
about um, climate measures as we see them from, from uh, Grad Saru. Um, whether the colleges are, are going to hold programs accountable for um, lack of change, um, I, I don't know yet. Uh, certainly that's what we're striving for, but that's the approach that we're taking at Minnesota. Uh, Lisa, do you want to? Yeah, no, th this is an excellent question. I think um, what success look like looks like defining that and, and tracking that is the biggest challenge in this area and, and the thing we've worked the least on, I think. And so it's been very piecemeal. Um, the levers, I think, have to be institutional, as you just said. So what made a big difference in the UC system was the addition in the academic personnel manual that contributions to diversity is actually part of how we evaluate faculty in tenure and promotion and and we're working toward having that also be part of how chairs evaluate faculty um, and and in particular questions of what kind of a citizen are they right like do they contribute to a positive climate in the department um, we, we just started an anti-bullying policy as part of our review i think that's that's really important um, and then the other levers you have you know what i have i mean it's nuclear and i'm not saying i would do this right but i have the power to deny graduate students to a program if a program is really not um, making progress in the way they can that's one thing that i can do i'm hoping never to get there but you know it is it is something we can do and then uh our budget committee that's that's the committee that decides on faculty um appointments who gets lines to hire they also take this into consideration and and they can deny faculty positions too but you know in order to get to that place we have to decide what success looks like and we have to have a regular way of of tracking it and at least at our institution we're, we're moving toward there but i don't think we're quite there yet Thank you, Lisa. I think we are, I, I would say at time, but we're past time. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, I really enjoyed uh, the conversation. Thank you to my uh, co-panelists and uh, Igor for organizing this.